Welcome. It's my job to welcome you here today. I am Dean Reuter, Vice President and General Counsel and Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. Very pleased to see such a big turnout on such a hot day. It would have been easy to skip this lunch. Um, it reminds me of a, a saying I heard. It's not very and a very nice saying about the French. Uh, one of the American generals said uh, that the French are always, wait a minute, when, we, when they need us, they're always there. That was the same. So, um, but it's my job to introduce our four panelists. I'm going to be almost rudely and certainly mercifully brief in introducing them. Uh, we're going to hear opening remarks from each after the judge makes a few remarks as the moderator. Uh, in that order, we'll hear from Matt Miner. He is a partner at Morgan Lewis and Bacchius right here in town. Uh, he'll be followed in his opening remarks by George Terwilliger, partner at McGuire Woods. And then finally, we'll hear from Alice Fisher, managing partner at Latham and Watkins. As I mentioned, uh, Judge uh, Richard Leon is our moderator today. I want to thank him in advance for uh, his help with this program. He was appointed in 2002 by President Bush and is a senior judge of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, where he, he keeps his courtroom at 68 degrees. So we're going to try and keep the room cool here. Um, he received his A.B. from Holy Cross College in 1971, his J.D. cum laude from Suffolk Law School, and an LLM from Harvard Law School in 1981. He was in private practice from 1989 to 2002, over a decade. He's also been at the Justice Department, and he teaches as an adjunct at GW and Georgetown. Now, importantly, perhaps for our purposes today, before private practice, he worked on Capitol Hill, where he served as a counsel to Congress in the investigations of three presidents in the Iran-Contra matter, the October surprise matter, and the Whitewater matter. Um, Everyone there benefited from his legal expertise, and today we benefit from his moderating role. With that, uh, Judge Leon. Well, I'm not used to <clears throat> using a microphone in a space this small. So I'm not going to um, speak as loud as I used to. But um, welcome to everyone. I think this should prove to be an interesting and perhaps even, uh, uh, let's say, a, a confrontational presentation today. We'll see, we'll see how this we'll see how this goes. Um, my role is really limited. I'm just uh, I'm just basically a traffic cop here for the three of them because they're all going to have so much to say that uh, you know I'm going to have to keep them from uh, dominating the conversation, but. I want to emphasize to you all one thing, and this is my only mission today for certain. Today's program is a discussion about the Yates Memo, not about the Comey testimony, or for that matter, the Yates testimony. So let's stay on topic. Let's ask questions that relate to the Yates Memo. Uh, you know, George and I have been around long enough to remember a time when deputy attorney generals, of which George was one, didn't write memos. But now we seem to be in a period where there's memos all the time. I can only imagine what Rosenstein's cooking up right now. <laughs> but hopefully he's not cooking anything up, and he's just focusing on doing his job. But that's a whole different subject. The Yates memo. We'll start with Alice. We're starting with Matt. Oh, we're going to start with Matt. Yeah, thank all you, right. Judge. And all I right. hate to disagree with you. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> Respectfully you said, of course. <laughs> Welcome to disagree. <laughs> so I will accept Alice's lateral, and I will try to set the uh, stage a little bit on the Yates memo, a little bit of background for those who uh, aren't as familiar with the policy and its background and some of the surrounding DOJ policies that predated it. The Yates memo uh, was announced in a speech by uh, then Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates, September 9th, uh, 2015. So it's almost two years old now. And the policy memo uh, was labeled the Individual Accountability Policy. And it, it, it was rolled out with a focus on individual accountability. So far, so good. Everyone believes that individuals who engage in wrongdoing should be held accountable. But there was a perception within the department and in her comments that came later that individuals were not being held accountable. And I'm sure that will be part of our discussion today as the overlay on the Yates memo and why it was written. On the very day that it was announced, the New York Times had a headline about the story. It said, Justice Department sets sights on Wall Street executives. 
And here's here's in the body of the piece down a uh, ways. Under Attorney General Eric Holder, the Justice Department faced repeated criticism from Congress and consumer advocates that it treated corporate executives leniently. After the 2008 financial crisis, no top Wall Street executives went to prison. And it continues and continues. So that's sort of the background and, and when this was launched, how it was perceived. So what did it say? What did it do? The Yates Memo had six principles Im embedded in it, all of which you would think would be aimed at individual accountability and, and bringing greater attention and focus on the prosecution and investigation of individuals engaged in white collar crime and corporate wrongdoing. And for some of the factors, that is the case. So for three of the factors, an increased focus on the culpability of the individual. Prosecutors were to focus on, on that as part of their uh, corporate investigations. There was to be a broadening of pursuit of remedies, criminal and civil, against individuals. So greater parallel investigations and prosecutions. And the department's prosecutors, in reaching resolution, uh, should focus on retribution and deterrence. Uh, don't just monetize, don't just look at how much an individual or a corporation should pay. Let's, let's focus on deterrence. So those three of the six factors were focused on individuals. Three other factors, however, focus largely on corporations, which is interesting in an individual accountability policy. Uh, one that I'll, I'll talk more about um, is the all or nothing approach to cooperation credit that was embedded in the Yates memo. Corporations were told through the memo, and prosecutors were directed, that a corporation should receive no credit for its cooperation unless it turned over all relevant facts as to any potentially culpable individual. So all or nothing, there's a threshold now for cooperation credit. Unless you give it all, you get nothing. Um, there should also be no protection for individuals in a corporate resolution. So you can't just have an umbrella settlement where officers and employees are not going to be pursued and everything's going to be resolved at the corporate level. And there's a requirement in resolving corporate uh, uh, investigations and charges that there needed to be a plan in place among the department's prosecutors, both the civil and criminal uh, and, and lawyers involved, for resolution as to individuals. And if you're going to move forward with a corporation and you don't have a plan for resolution, it has to be uh, signed off on at a high level by the assistant attorney general, by the U.S. attorney, uh, him or herself. So that, those are the six principles. And as you can see, not all of them relate to individuals. Half of them relate to corporations. And I think that that's an important piece because in considering those changes, you have to look at what has been around for quite a while in the department as part of these deputy memos. Uh, starting in 1999 with then Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder and going through a Thompson memo and a McNulty memo. Um, you have the, the Phillip factors, which means that Mark Phillip didn't want to write a memo. He put the factors in the U.S. Attorney Manual. There have been uh, a set of factors that are to be considered, or principles that are to be considered whenever prosecutors evaluate, what, evaluate how to close out a corporate criminal investigation and whether to bring charges. One of those nine factors is, did the company voluntarily disclose to the, uh, to the government, and, and did the government cooperate, or the, uh, uh, the corporation cooperate with the government and its prosecutors? Over time, that has been treated as more or less a sliding scale. And one of the questions with the Yates memo when it came out in September is, will that change, will that change this, this policy that's been embedded in the U.S. Attorney's Manual since 2008 and been a part of the department's policy since 1999? Um, leaving no doubt to that, in November, the U.S. Attorney Manual was modified and here's a, a statement from um, then Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates' speech to the American Bankers Association on that day, and uh, as if to remove any ambiguity. In the past, cooperation credit was a sliding scale of sorts, and companies could still receive at least some credit for cooperation, even if they failed to fully disclose all facts about individuals. That's changed now. As the policy makes clear, providing complete information about an individual's involvement in wrongdoing is a threshold hurdle that must be crossed before we'll consider any cooperation credit. So there's really no ambiguity about it at all. The U.S. Attorney's Manual, when it was modified, made clear that there was now a minimum threshold for cooperation. 
that it would be decided at the end of the cooperative efforts, and there would not be a determination unless prosecutors agreed, and it was really a determination by the prosecutor who was handling the case, signed off upon by superiors, as to whether corporations would receive any cooperation credit. And so that's where we find ourselves now. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Matt. Um, it's a good, uh, great foundation for, for this discussion. Um, Judge Leon mentioned um, the um, sort of cascade of memos that seems to flow from the, the deputy's office. There once was a Terwilliger memo. This memo, um, <laughs> being two years old, um, is ancient uh, by terms of, I think mine was gone in the first three days of the Clinton administration. So um, it's high time we reconsider the Yates memo, I think. Um, <clears throat> what I thought I might do is try to um, put the Yates memo and its exhortations to prosecute individuals into a slightly larger context involving the prosecution of business crime. Um, and that concerns uh, the, the, what many of us have said for some time, uh, may be the overuse of criminal law to prosecute and sanction corporations. Um, just a, a very briefest of background on that notion. Uh, corporations, of course, can't think. So they can't form the traditional intent uh, that marks a criminal violation in our, in our law, in the tradition of our law, going back to the origins of criminal law, really. Um, corporations also can't be imprisoned, which is another hallmark of, of a criminal prosecution. You can just take their money. So you can take their money through other civil enforcement mechanisms just as readily as you can criminally. So a question can be asked, why should the innocent shareholders of a corporation be punished for what managers uh, do? People obviously can think. Um, and the logic goes that because people within the corporate structure think and thus can form mens rea, the intent to do a bad act, um, that that makes them the people that should be held responsible for culpable criminal conduct. So that in turn leads to the notion theoretically that it's much more fair as a general proposition um, to hold true to principles establishing criminal responsibility and hold real persons responsible for um, acts committed on behalf of fictional corporations that may violate the law. But that notion also carries some problems with it all by itself. Um, and that is generally that business people don't like to go to jail. They don't like to send other people uh, to jail. Um, and they don't like people who help send their colleagues to jail. So a practice evolved in as white collar uh, prosecutions and defense developed that more often or not, the corporation would, and I'm generalizing, but more often than not, corporation would take the fall um, for the individuals. And while there might have not been an explicit quid pro quo between prosecutors and uh, corporate defense counsel. There was a tacit understanding that if the corporation will plead to A, B, C, and D, um, then we'll leave the individuals here alone. And there are, well, there clearly were, and um, have been exceptions to that. Um, and um, uh, but generally, that's kind of how things worked. The Yates memo um, is kind of the culmination of resistance to that notion that corporations should be allowed to take the fall and individual wrongdoers um, escape. But that resistance also ran into problems, particularly in the last administration, and for reasons which we could take this hour and a few more to, to discuss. Basically, that administration made sport out of pillaring corporations for alleged criminal activity, like having sticky accelerators that never caused an accident, or pooling payment streams from various kinds of mortgages into a security and not disclosing risks that by anybody's reckoning uh, anybody would know were there. But and it, I digress. I'm sorry, Dick. Um, so into the middle of all this evolution uh, lands the Yates memo. 
And But the Yates memo itself produced even more problems because, as Matt explained, what it does is basically say to prosecutors, look, before we're going to let you close a case out, you're going to have to get permission to prosecute the corporation and leave individuals alone. So what's it easier for a prosecutor to do? Work up the food chain of the, the U.S. Attorney's Office or the Justice Organization and get permission to move ahead without prosecuting an individual and explain why the prosecutor was so inadequate that he or she could not gather enough evidence to prosecute somebody or indict somebody. That's easy. You put it in an indictment, you put it before the grand jury, you're done. Um, so how do they do that? Um, well, one of the ways that that's been done and a phenomena that's developed in this over-criminalization is we have a vast array of federal regulations that govern all kinds of things that businesses do, Medicare cost reports, environmental regulations, financial services regulations. So prosecutors have become super regulators in many cases where they interpret those regulations themselves and they say, oh, you were supposed to do A, B, C, or D here, and you didn't. And you know what? That's a crime because you submitted that report. Um, that's a false or fraudulent statement with the intent to get money or some benefit from somebody else. So um, you committed a felony. We'll just put that in the indictment. Then I don't have to go up the food chain and explain why I don't want to indict you. Um, so. This has produced another sort of basic unfairness, and the Yates memo has sort of hastened uh, the trend uh, toward, towards doing that. Um, because the Yates memo demands holding individual, uh, pros uh, individual um, uh, business people accountable. Um, and it's easier to overreach than it is not to indict. So is there an answer to this, to stop being facetious, or somewhat facetious, um, and, and address a, a serious policy issue? I think the answer is yes. Clearly, individuals who actually form the intent to do a bad act in the context of some business crime need to be held accountable. Fraudsters and um, other kinds of crooks that either use a business as a criminal enterprise or turn a legitimate business into a criminal enterprise, yes, those people should be prosecuted because um, the whole purpose of federal criminal law is to preserve from dishonesty the means and instrumentalities of state commerce. That's the federal role, uh, the proper federal role, in my view, in all of that. So if somebody's doing something that basically uh, permeates the, the stream of commerce with fraud and, and other kinds of basic criminality, of course they should be prosecuted. But we ought to take the emphasis off that the Yates memo put on of tr having to hold somebody accountable, as Matt said, as sort of a threshold uh, determination for corporate co cooperation because it has the, the, the kind of uh, gravitational effect of bending the universe of fairness, um, in my view. Um, there are some other aspects of this that maybe we'll get to, but with that, I'll, I'll flip it to Alice. Great. Um, Great segue into something that I think that I think about, which is on the other side of this, um, when you're holding the corporation liable when there isn't an individual that actually had the specific intent to do something wrong. And that's not something that the Yates memo talks about at all. But it is, as Matt said, the Yates memo and, and the prescriptions are part of the corporate charging principles and, and what prosecutors are trained on when they're thinking about charging a corporation. And so, you know, part of this, and, and George has talked about the going up the chain to justify why you're not indicting a particular individual, and if you don't, as corporate counsel, provide all the facts and circumstances about an individual that would be accountable, you can't get cooperation credit. What happens when there is no one person within a corporation that has that specific intent to commit the crime? And, and there's no guidance about that in the, in the context of the Yates memo, and I'm certainly not suggesting, could, because I do not want to disagree with Judge Leon, that there should be another memo on this. But I do think that it's something that the Department of Justice should think about, and I'm sure that they are thinking about, in the context of collective knowledge and collective intent, and how that interplay um, 
comes into into account when there is no one person individually that has that specific intent to commit the crime. So if you go all the way back to the First Circuit case of Bank of New England, you see that a corporation acts through individuals, and sometimes there's many different pieces of a corporation that has knowledge of particular bad acts that are, you know, the the basis for the criminal uh, conduct. So that's collective knowledge. And, and people talk about that as saying you could take this piece and this piece from this person and this piece over here and this person over here. And you add that all up together, and that's the corporate knowledge. Um, and that's what you think about when you're charging a corporation when there's not just one uh, individual that you can get respondeat superior kind of vicarious liability through. So you have that collective knowledge. And that that seems to make sense. You know, a, a company uh, can have more knowledge than just is housed in one, one individual or one agent. But what's happened in the specific intent area where the crime is you have to do it knowing and willfully, how do you get that willfulness? And what you see is is different courts addressing the collective intent prong of corporate criminal liability differently. And I see sometimes there's confusion and there's courts that do it differently and there's prosecutors that come to a discussion differently when you're talking about can you add up all of the knowledge such to an, an, an event that that will equal enough specific intent to say that the corporation is liable when there's no individual that can be accountable. And um, you know how does that interplay with regulatory crimes and how does that interplay with um, other things that the Justice Department rightfully so, needs to hold companies liable for. So so I, I worry about it um, from that perspective as well, because if you're sitting across the table from a prosecutor and you're defending the corporation and they say, well, you're not cooperating if you don't show me which individual is accountable, then you're not going to get cooperation credit. And if you're not having a discussion that's really a dialogue that, you know, are we talking about collective knowledge? Are we co talking about collective intent? and how they're supposed to address that, then all of a sudden you have a corporation that where there's nobody that had specific intent. You have a lot of knowledge, but it's unclear where the, the willfulness comes from, and yet the, the corporation is going to pay a large settlement at the end of the day because the corporation is not going to be able to take that risk and take it to trial, particularly in a regulated uh, industry where your main customer is the government. And so... Again, no memo, and that's not even addressed in the in the Yates memo. But when you're having the discussion about individual accountability, I think it's good to also, you know, have a discussion of what are the limits of collective knowledge, collective intent, and how is that interplay appropriate with regard to corporate criminal liability in the criminal context. Civil may be different, maybe not. Some of these cases on collective knowledge are civil cases, but. Well, let me start off by asking the three of you a question and get each of your uh, viewpoint on this subject. <clears throat> From an outward observer point of view as a judge, this, what this memo looks like to me is the government wants you to conduct their investigation for them. Now, the three of you are in the business of conducting internal investigations for corporations, obviously. This is one of the ways you earn your living. So my question would be this. If you want to conduct, if you're going to conduct an investigation for the company that's hired you, uh, to what extent do you interpret the Yates memo to require you to give them the factual conduct of individuals in the company, or even more than that, the inferences and conclusions that you draw from the factual conduct? Because as you all know from experience, Oftentimes, you'll have facts about what a particular individual did, but that, whether or not they intended X, Y, or Z, is an inference that you draw from those facts. Where do you draw the line as to what, what you view, in light of the Yates memo, cooperation to consist of? Is it the facts of what the individuals did, or is it more than that? Is it the inferences and conclusions that you and your client, with your advice, draw from those facts? Matt? Well, I, I think that what you want to do is you only want to present the facts, but the investigation is intended to gather the information through the lens of, of counsel. And that includes 
how it will impact the company, including the mental impressions during interviews. That's what's captured in the work product. And it's very difficult to divorce that from what is presented to the government, especially you when- You don't have to put it in the work product, do you? You don't have to put it in the work product, but you run risks if you divorce your, your um, interview memos from any mental impressions whatsoever, and it looks like a transcript. Uh, well, those are covered by the attorney-client privilege, aren't they? This <laughs> Now we're getting into interesting conversations you have with the Department of Justice where uh -huh. they do ask for, and they've increasingly started asking for, again, um, memoranda of interviews uh, and including well, unredacted, unedited yeah, that's, memoranda. That's going back to the Mary Jo White era that we thought uh, Larry Thompson had, had trumped that and said no more of that waving attorney-client privilege requirement stuff. And there's no, a, we just want the facts. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's what's been said. So uh, Attorney Gen or Deputy Attorney General Yates, when uh, she was speaking at the American Bankers Association and elsewhere, she said, we're not interested in, in your privileged materials. We're not interested in that at all. All we want are the facts. But if you think about it from the perspective of how you get those facts, it's kind of like going and asking the priest, I don't really care what you said uh, to the parishioner, to the penitent. I just want to know what they told you. You defeat the privilege when you go there. Uh, no, please. Um, well, it's a great question, Judge. And um, That's why not, I asked it. Of course, um, and not not surprising from the from the uh, perspective of sitting up in a courtroom on the bench and listening to testimony, because indeed the answer to your question really is that's what we have trials for, right? Exactly. Um, but the fact of the matter is that um, the in in terms of corporate criminality, we've basically lost sight of the adversary system. Um, it's it's one big uh, uh, cooperation party, or or so. It's it's designed to be. And it does put counsel doing an internal investigation in most circumstances into a, a very difficult position. You know, the memo says, uh, the Yates memo says, corporations must provide to the department all relevant facts relating to individuals responsible for the misconduct. Well, who's responsible for the misconduct is a judgment, not yes. a fact, isn't it? And that should be covered by the attorney-client privilege, shouldn't it? Well, it can be or it cannot be. I mean, that's that's sort of up to the corporation and something well, that, as a practical matter, companies have to look at at the outset. It's one of the things that has led, in some circumstances, to having one law firm do the fact investigation, which is non-privileged, and another law firm do the legal analysis, which remains privileged. Um, it also well, depends... That could be expensive, George. Uh, it, it can be, <laughs> but it all costs money. Um, um, so, so is getting indicted. Um, but um, it, it also depends sometimes on who the client is. Um, uh, I've worked on situations, for example, where the client is the audit committee of a public corporation. And they not only want to get all the facts and find out who's responsible, they want to get the people in management that are responsible out. When you're working for management, there might be less ardor um, to identify bad guys. But again, that depends on the level. I mean, most corporations, major corporations, are inherently honest businesses. And if somebody is dishonest, um, it's, a, it's a sort of stain on their culture. So they want to find the facts. But the fact remains that it's still a subjective judgment. Um, what, what usually results from that is um, you do more spilling of the guts rather than less and leave it up to the prosecutors to decide who is responsible for the misconduct um, by giving them all the facts. But that can be very, very difficult and in terms of an ongoing business creates a lot of day-to-day -day problems. Well, if you, know, if you know that going into your investigation, wouldn't that incentivize you in consultation with your client to get an outside counsel for the individual uh, uh, executive in the company who you suspect might be guilty of possible uh, culpable conduct. Yes, yes, indeed. And indeed, one of the effects of the Yates memo has been that people lawyer up a lot earlier in yep. the process uh, than Which they Which might used end to. up frustrating the, uh, the objective that it, the government's trying to achieve. It, and slows things down. That's right. And makes it more expensive. It does. It absolutely does. Because I, when you don't know where they're coming from and you don't know exactly where the investigation is going and you have to decide from the very beginning we're going to cooperate by giving all the facts and circumstances, then you do have to worry about putting somebody in a trick box. Um, and that is in con it, that's in contrast with your duty to the company to find all the facts so they can remediate and get rid of the wrongdoers. 
And so, you know, it, it does put a little strain on that relationship. Having said that, um, my experience since the memo, uh, it hasn't changed that much. I think that experience counsel was always getting defense counsel in for the individual when they believed that something caught cross the threshold that they were going to either disclose to the government or that person could put themselves in jeopardy and, you know, offer that up and try to get the facts uh, regardless of that. So I think um, the, the, the fact that there's no sliding scale and it's all or nothing potentially creates strain at the beginning. And I think it slows things down, unfortunately. What, what happens, Alice? You were assistant attorney general of the criminal division, obviously, at one point in your career. What happens in a situation where the criminal division and its counsel reach one conclusion about the degree of cooperation, and the counsel for the company, probably people who are former prosecutors themselves, have a completely different view about the extent to which they have cooperated under Yates or, or any other memo for that right. matter. Who, who decides? Does a judge decide somewhere? Okay, I think the, the government's right, or I think the defense is right. There's really been cooperation here, or there hasn't been cooperation here. H how does that get resolved? Um, sadly, I don't really think that there's some appeal mechanism for cooperation. And the reason is it, it's not going to court. They're, the corporation is going to settle at the end of the day. And so how prosecutors are viewing the company's cooperation is going up the chain within the Department of Justice if you want to appeal it, right? So it's going from the prosecutor to the U.S. attorney, or it's, if it's in Maine Justice, it's going from, you know, through a section chief to, you know, up to the assistant attorney general. And by the time you're in front of the assistant attorney general, you're not you're not complaining about cooperation unless unless it's a big part of the fine that you're not getting. You're complaining about the merits. You're trying to make your legal arguments because you can't argue about everything there. And the worst thing to do is start pointing fingers at the prosecutors or saying, you know, they're uh, not being reasonable or things like that. You want the assistant attorney general or the U.S. attorney to focus on the merits and to give you some relief that way. So I think that cooperation dialogue has to, you know, go on throughout the investigation and you should not wait until the end to see whether the the prosecutor is going to give you full credit or not. Did because you ever, if you don't know going in, it's going to change your strategy. Did you ever have a situation, at least when you were there, or have you known of any since you've been there, where the parties agree to disagree on the, the extent of cooperation, will enter a plea, and will let the judge decide the extent to which cooperation has actually uh, occurred, and then let him or her factor that into their sentence. Yeah. I don't remember any uh, cases like that in the corporate context that came up. I can't say that there weren't. I don't, I don't remember them. Mm -hmm. But I would say the Yates memo wasn't in place when I was the assistant attorney general. Right. And so it was very much a sliding scale of how you were going to cooperate. And some people cooperated by, you know, getting overseas evidence uh, that the Justice Department otherwise couldn't get or over complying or different kinds of disclosures. But it wasn't an all or nothing thing. And at the end of the day, it may be a downward departure when you're negotiating the fine 25 percent credit or, or something like that. Um, the, the thing that sometimes concerns me that judge uh, that George hit on was if you disagree about what the facts mean and you can turn over all the facts but at the end of the day if you say we don't think this adds up to a crime here right. and they disagree on that um, sometimes that's couched as you're not cooperating because you don't agree with me. And that's something to be very mindful of. I don't think it happens a lot, but once in a while, you know, you have to continue to be able to advocate for your client, even if you turn over all of the facts as to what it means. Mm -hmm. Another effect, Dick, along those lines of, of individuals, um, uh, this emphasis on individuals, is um, individuals get nervous when you get into a situation um, like this. And what do people do when they think their, their conduct in their job um, might come under scrutiny? They start thinking about, well, what did I say to him or her? What did I put in an email? Should I delete those emails? Um, what did I say in my text or other instant messages? Should I delete those? What is so-and-so going to say when the investigators talk to them? Maybe I should talk to them. And each one of those instances is, of course, fraught with the possibility that they engage in some non-cooperative conduct. And one of the things I've noticed with the department 
um, at least uh, you know over the last few years, has been that the actions of a few people, you know, the old saw about the cover-up is worse than the crime. The actions of a few people sort of down the employment chain a ways will be held against the corporation as being either obstruct obstruction or uh, or non-cooperative conduct, when in fact the corporation, as Alice was just alluding to, has really turned all the facts over. Um, but you can't you can't uh, fight human nature and a little bit more reasonableness from prosecutors sometimes in terms of understanding that this pressure on individuals, you know, when they see somebody like in the Volkswagen case, to use an example, get arrested at an airport in Miami when they're coming here for vacation or whatever, that has an effect on how people react as a practical matter to the fact of an investigation. Well, the the provision in here about no protection for individuals in a corporate resolution, has that resulted in companies as a result of not being able to do that, taking out more insurance to pay for the legal fees of the attorneys they're going to bring in to represent corporate executives who might be the target of the internal investigation? I've heard in your experience. I mean, I, I, you know. I, I don't know the numbers, but I have ha I've had the question raised. I know it's something that's being considered by companies, and it's it's a real real issue. But I don't have the numbers to know if that's gone up or not. I think, I think jury's still out, so to speak, on that, and where it's going to lead at the end of the day. I think when you think about the language in the memo as it applies civilly. You know, go after individuals, hold individuals accountable in the civil context, even if in the past you might not have included them in a complaint because they didn't have any resources or something like that, and it wasn't worth the department's time, that there's a deterrent effect in um, using individuals as part of that complaint, maybe in a false claims act case or something like that. I think that's where insurance really comes into to play because if a corporation wants to settle uh, a regulatory civil case, but the, the government will no longer give you release for the civil individuals, for the civil liability of the individuals, generally those individuals are going to be covered by the insurance policy because now we're talking about recklessness as the standard, not out-and-out out criminal conduct or fraud. And so it's so important if a company is settling a civil case criminally not to know that it's going to have to double pay, either through insurance or through directly, for that reckless conduct by somebody in the billing department. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that aspect of this is still kind of percolating through, and I'm not sure exactly what it, impact it will have. Have any of you had the experience yet uh, in the aftermath of the Yates memo of having a client, or are you aware of any anyone having this situation, where you're aware of a client who wanted to get a resolution for his corporation that he was representing or her corporation they're representing. They wanted to get a resolution, but the assistant U.S. attorney or fraud section lawyer uh, couldn't get a check off from their superiors on no individual liability for certain individuals, which is a requirement now under the Yates memo. You have to get a written check off from your superiors if you're the, pros the front line prosecutor uh, of no individual liability. So there was basically a debate between whether there was individual liability. <coughs> Counsel for the company said there, there isn't a, a viable case here. Prosecutor agreed with them, but the superiors were saying there is a viable case here. Have you have you seen that kind of situation? I have. Not yet. No, but as, as Alice said, things have gone more slowly, and there there is this sand in the gears uh, mm -hmm. aspect to the memo by requiring these levels of, of checkoff, by requiring um, cooperation that is you know all as to everyone, and and I also think that there is tension because. If you approach things from counsel, from the perspective of counsel for a company, and you look at some of the incentives that the department's tried to create mm -hmm. for moving quickly, mm -hmm. whether you're talking about the FCPA pilot program or the National Security Division voluntary disclosure guidance, those are, are intended to create a carrot to bring uh, companies in early and disclose the facts from their investigations early on. Well, if you're slowing things down on the back end, you really wonder what kind of, of odd disincentives you're creating and are you, are you also creating confusion um, to the regulated community of the bar? 
as you send these mixed signals. Mm -hmm. And that's that's true in um, in antitrust as well, which is, as you know, has had a so-called leniency policy for a long time. That the first one in with real cooperation. Um, uh, gets a pass, uh, which is probably the most generous of, of all those programs. But um, the other phenomena that gets created uh, by this that's probably worth at least noting, if not a little bit of discussion, is that um, uh, suppose, to, uh, just to take your last question, Judge, the, the corporation has reached a resolution, um, but you have an individual who is not willing to reach a resolution. Um, Corporations, you know, are motivated more often than not by we just want to get this behind us. Absolutely. Uh, pay money, get rid of it, lose the adverse publicity, and so forth. Um, and when you're just paying money, that's a relatively easy decision to make. Um, but when um, an individual faces a resolution that may expose them, at least, to the possibility of going to prison, not so fast. Um, and as a result. Um, the, the ability of corporations to bring things to complete closure, um, it becomes more limited because a lot of the, the benefits of, of closure through some kind of a, a deferred prosecution agreement or other resolution, successful resolution with the government, many of those benefits are lost if there's going to be another two years worth of publicity when the president of the company goes to trial. Well. Um We've had the experience in our courthouse in recent years of example after example after example. Two of them in particular played out in my courtroom, in the FCPA arena, where the government totally misread their chances of winning a case at trial in a white collar setting. Mm. And it raises questions, at least in my mind, and I'm sure in other people's minds, as to how capable the decision makers are at a certain level in a, at a time when 97 to 98% of all criminal cases are resolved by plea. Okay. How capable the decision makers are in evaluating the realistic prospects of actually succeeding at trial. I mean, we have had a series of white collar cases that have fallen apart and blown up in our courthouse, and that's just one courthouse here in this country in the last, it's, last it's five years. Point. I wouldn't put it so much perhaps in the, in, under the context respectfully of capability as experience. I think we all know that a prosecutor who's tried a bunch of cases and sort of can place a given situation on a continuum between a dog and a winner mm -hmm. um, is a, a much fairer adversary Absolutely. than somebody who uh, is, is less well informed, we'll put it. Well, um, I, I think that most of the people in the Department of Justice that are bringing these cases are there to work at the Department of Justice and investigate cases and uh, do their job, and they do it ethically and professionally, and they are trying their best. And sometimes they're going to win, and sometimes they're going to lose. And sometimes the decisions that they make at the beginning of the case will take different different uh, uh, weights in, in the trial. So I, I don't know. I wouldn't say it's capability or experience. My experience at the Department of Justice where people were, you know, very much focused and committed on doing their job. And that's my experience now as a defense counsel. That doesn't mean that cases won't go aside from time to time. And, and you know, I don't, I don't know about all the particular cases that... Uh, you're referring to, I think I know of one. Um, oh, you know of more than one. <laughs> um, and I don't think I was there at They the weren't time, on your on watch. Time, yeah. But, but um, in any event, I, I do think that there is a point here, which is most of the cases against corporations are settled. And particularly because the the corporation, if they are dealing with the government, the government is their customer, they're regulated by the government, it's exactly what George said, which is at some point it has to end because we are about business. We, we aren't about the business of defending ourselves with the <laughs> Department of Justice, and we need a good relationship with them. And so then there are the individual white collar cases that are brought in the 93 U.S. Attorney's Offices and Maine Justice. And um, sometimes they're uh, based on full facts that you know at the beginning, and sometimes they're not. Did you find that uh, there are foreign jurisdictions 
that have strict protections for employees against criminal liability mm. uh, when there's a investigation of the company they're working for. And of course, many of the, com the companies that the, the Yates memo would apply to operate around the world. And so they're, you know, they have uh, employees in these various jurisdictions around the world where there are strict protections for those employees uh, should there be a internal investigation or something like that. Did you ever find that that was a particular challenge or problem to the uh, resolution of the case, either from a prosecution side or from a defense side? Go ahead. Well, it's certainly, uh, if I'm understanding your question right, it's certainly um, a challenge to a resolution based on facts where internal investigations become a lot more difficult because of the, those kinds of employee protections. Mm -hmm. um, and some jurisdictions, it's also just the opposite. In Germany, for example, a corporation cannot be held criminally liable except um, on the basis of something that one of its agents or employees did. So there's the, the investigation in Germany by German authorities is always of the individual as a way to get to the corporation. I do think that as we do internal investigations all over the world, that you come into situations where there's a works council, then you have different you know, mandates about how you can and can't investigate or you can and can't talk to that person or or if you do talk to that person when they have to be terminated, you know, within 30 days and things like that. There are those kind of employee restrictions. There's also restrictions on when you can fire somebody, even if you found, find out that you believe that they were engaged in wrongdoing in certain countries. There's all sorts of data privacy issues that are real and some are criminal as far as when you can bring documents into the U.S. So for international investigations, very, um, very much can slow things down as to how you need to proceed. And lawyers, both the, both the government and defense counsel, need to be very aware um, so they're not coloring outside the lines on what those uh, regulations are in a foreign country. It's very important in this day and age to be, under, to be able to understand what you're getting into when you go on foreign soil. And that's for the government as well as defense counsel. There's a, so when the Yates memo was embedded into the U.S. Attorney Manual, there's actually a footnote that is very much buried in the text. And you have to look for it. But it, it does say that if there are facts that the company cannot present as part of this cooperation, this all or nothing cooperation, that the burden is on the company and the company's counsel to identify what those facts are and to explain the obstacles. So I think the point of that is as to data privacy, as to the obstacles that you would run into in these jurisdictions, but the way it's worded, uh, it's it's a little bit more broad. And so of course it leads to questions about, well, I don't if I don't know what I can't find, how can I point out to the government what I'm unable to identify? So that I think that could be tightened up a little bit. But I do think there was a nod to that in the U.S. <coughs> Attorney Manual. I just think it probably should be tightened up and be made more express. Which kind of begs the next question, which is, how do you determine uh, in consultation with your client, the say it's the general counsel of the company, the, the breadth and the scope and the expense of the investigation you're going to conduct in order to in order to comply with the Yates memo on the one hand, but not bankrupt the company on the other. How, how do you find that balance point where you're doing more than enough to satisfy the government that you're, hey, you're investigating this, but on the other hand, you're not bankrupting the company? Because not every company is General Motors or you know, Volkswagen. Right. How do you do that? How do you, how do you find that balance point? Not easily. No, that's right. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's... Um, I, I, to give credit where credit's due, I thought that in the in the last administration, when Leslie Caldwell had Alice's job and made a couple of uh, speeches, one of which the department made her walk back, but that was sort of a little different. Um, she 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 tried to give some guidance on the expectation of prosecutors on the answer to that, and said among other things, you know, you don't have to boil the ocean to do a thorough and complete investigation. Um, but it, your, your question, again, Judge, is right on the money because, it, I mean, 
in my It's about the money. Uh, yeah, well, it is about the money, but it's also about the disruption to the business. Um, and I will say the cultures, in my experience, the cultures you run into in different companies can be really different in terms of how they affect uh, that. One, one of the probably the most um, important driving factors is the role of outside directors on the board. Um, where you have very active outside directors on the board and probably you know, uh, peopling the, the uh, audit committee, um, they want to an internal investigation to get to everything because the best protection that a board member has against a shareholder suit is I saw a red flag, I acted on it, we got all the information, we fixed it. Um, management may not share that view um, exactly. in, in many instances and striking the balance between the two of those, um, and, and after all, I mean, one of the things we all have to remember is they're the clients, they decide. Um, and, um, and frankly, sometimes you have to um, not, uh, not undermine your advice, but you have to couch your advice in terms of what their expectations are for what's a reasonably thorough but, effort. But in a sense, George, aren't they being asked by you as their counsel to make a choice as to how much is it worth to cooperate? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. How, how much? How, yeah. how much? How much are you willing to spend? Yes. To satisfy this cooperation right. agreement. A, a lot of times, frankly, I mean, I'd like to Alice and Matt to address this, but a lot of times it really it also depends on the size of the company and the size of the problem. Right. Um, you know, when you have a problem. <laughs> Um, again, I'll just I'll pick on Volkswagen. Um, you know, when you have a problem of that dimension, um, when when you look at the potential consequences, sure. um, the cost of investigation becomes a minor sure. irritant. Sure. Yeah, I agree. I you know I tend to think that dialogue with the government yeah. is important, and that means they have to be willing to talk to you too. Exactly. So sometimes I feel like. Uh, you know, taking off the handcuffs a little bit to have more of a transparency would be better because it helps everybody. You know what they want you to look at. You go look at them. It's an iterative process where at the end of the day, you don't have to, as George said, boil the ocean from the beginning. What you could do is just phase it and say, we're going to look at this first. And if that leads us to look at more, we're going to look at more. And, and, and we're going to have a dialogue along the way. So we're not trying to hide it. What he said about the tension between the company and the board is very true. And one of the things that I um, like to advise general counsels on is that you need to make sure your audit committee or compliance committee or whoever it is is happy with the scope that you're doing because there is a tension there as far as, you know, where, where, how far do you go and you don't want to be second guessed as to how you drew the scope. Exactly. And, and I was just going to say, uh, just echo something that Alice said, and, and it really is a, a point for, for good advocates and good counsel, and, and I've seen George and Alice in action on this, where <laughs> we're in engaging with the government uh, and trying to get them to narrow their requests, the follow-on requests, understanding not only there's a cost to it, but there are costs in terms of not just monetary costs, but delays, um, and that you're going to wind up producing a lot of hay and not a lot of needles. To the extent that you can have that cooperative dialogue with the government, you can convince them of that, you can narrow their requests and the follow-ons and try to speed things along. Now, I, I think the Yates memo and the expectation of you know all as to everybody, that works against that. Mm -hmm. um, but at, at the same time, you have prosecutors who, if they want to close their case, they want to get to the facts, um, they will work with you. And I've seen mm -hmm. that happen a, a, a fair number of times, and I've seen a lot of reasonable mm -hmm. conduct to get to exactly that, what the issue is. Is there any sense in the private bar, or for that matter, among people who are, you know, in the government right now, that the Yates memo will either be, uh, in some way, jettisoned or modified, or do, do you have any sense worse. of where it's going? <laughs> or, huh? <laughs> or made worse? Yeah. Do you have any sense of that? Uh, is it too soon? I don't. I mean, I doubt that they're going to do some wholesale withdrawal of the Yates memo. I mean, some of the things as George. And Matt, we're putting out the conduct. Some of these things have been around the department for a long time in the sure. historical context of holding individuals accountable. And I think that that is, that is good and that's guidance. I, 
I wouldn't be surprised if over the next few years um, there's tweaks along the way mm-hmm. as far as um, that could be in the form of training or internal guidance and things like that. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a memo. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my prediction, but it's based on nothing. In April, <laughs> the Attorney General said in uh, uh, remarks at the Ethics and Compliance Initiative Annual Conference, um, he said it's, quote, not always possible, unquote, to hold individuals responsible that prosecutors need to take into account a company's cooperation when making charging decisions and that businesses should not be held responsible for isolated mistakes by employees. Now, that's not a memo and it's not a, uh, a firm policy pronouncement, but if it's indicative of a little thinking in that direction, maybe there's some hope. I, I think that you you will see changes over time. This is a policy that has changed over time. I, I talked about the Holder memo becoming the Thompson memo and so on and so forth. So there have been tweaks over time. Actually, I think that's when I first met you, George, was when I was working in the Senate Judiciary Committee and, and there was a debate about the Thompson memo and would it be uh, changed or repealed and, and it was modified. And these policies are modified to bring clarity to um, not just what prosecutors should be doing, but also to the bar and the corporate community. And to the extent that some of the things we talked about here are not clear, and that's being, um, and, the, and the department is aware of those, you'll see um, some pressure to make some changes. But I agree, you're not gonna see the concept of individual accountability um, just thrown away or the, or the Yates memo repealed in a wholesale fashion. Do you think as a result of the Yates memo, prosecutors will be unable to make deferred prosecution agreements, some of which I've seen, that included within it no prosecution for any individuals. You, you cannot have a DPA that says we won't prosecute individuals. You cannot, under the memo. So unless that part of the memo is repealed, you can't do a civil settlement or a criminal settlement with the Department of Justice that releases individuals. What you can do is you can say, we need clarity, and we would like you to tell us, are you going to continue to pursue individuals? They may tell you. They may not tell you um, that they're continuing. And of course, with every deferred prosecution agreement, there's an ongoing cooperation commitment for the three years or the length of the DPA. So there always could be ongoing investigation after, during the DPA period, where, you, where the company is required to cooperate, including against individuals. So um, I think the days of release on the civil side or the criminal side are over, and I, I, don't, I don't know that they'll change that particular part of it. I haven't, I haven't heard anybody talking about it. Well, let's take some questions from the audience. Sir, there's a microphone right there. No, no, right, right there. Right there. <laughs> oh, let him come up to the podium. Come on. <laughs> so there was mention about nervous executives lawyering up. There was one mention only about a lower level employee, I think Alice mentioned, uh, the billing department. Do you think you should have an obligation when interviewing an employee, not an executive, to inform them that you are also acting as an agent for the Department of Justice? Because you really aren't. Matt? <laughs> well, I, I, the, the Upjohn warning is, is, has always been intended to make that point clear for the, the, uh, the employees who are being interviewed, that you're acting on behalf of the company. And if there is an ongoing investigation, uh, I've, I've always felt that you're better off acknowledging that there is an ongoing government investigation to the extent you're allowed to. Sometimes uh, investigations can't be disclosed. Part of that is, if one person in the billing department in Poughkeepsie knows about it, then you can be pretty well assured that their sister office in Des Moines knows about it. And so you should acknowledge it up front. You should mention uh, and be very clear in your upjohn warning. And, and, and that should be your policy throughout in those interviews. I don't think that it behooves anybody in uh, an interview context to say, I am here as an agent of the government, unless you really are an agent of the government. I think. Go ahead. No, no. I think, uh, so. I, think I think I don't mean to make light of a of a serious question because it does go straight to lawyers' ethical obligations to protect people from themselves sometimes. Um, 
it's a balance to be struck. It's often difficult to tell until you have some level of interview with somebody whether they might be in jeopardy or not. So you give a standard upjohn warning. Um, I do not think it's a bad idea for several reasons, including um, telling people the consequent, the potential consequences of not telling the truth in an internal investigation. To tell them that it may be reasonably foreseeable that your statements will wind up in the hands of the government and therefore um, could expose you. That's even more true the way prosecutors are using what is uh, 18 U.S.C. 1519, which is uh, uh, a criminal section that uh, was added through the Sarbanes-Oxley law that prosecutors are interpreting as um, the, uh, the mother of all false statement statutes. So if you make a false statement in company records that may be looked at by the government someday, that could be um, a felony violation carrying a 20-year penalty, by the way. So the stakes on the, on the question have been raised, Professor, is my, my view. Um, and um, so I think you talk to somebody long enough to see that maybe they do have some jeopardy, and then you have to stop and uh, tell the company, look, I think we need to get counsel or offer counsel for that individual. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's a line. It's kind of a zone. Yeah, I agree. But I do think definitely you need to be forward-leaning when you talk to them and say, you know, it may be that the company is going to turn over the statements that I gather, yours and anybody else's, over to the government or some third party at some point in time. And, and, and I think, you know, that emphasis may or may not have been on the Upjohn warnings that, that were given, you know, 15 years ago, but it certainly is something I think in the forefront of every defense counsel's mind, and it's underscored, and I absolutely think that everybody should make sure that they fully understand that. I will say that there was a lot of talk at the beginning of the memo that, you were going to get less cooperation and people would clam up once you, you know, were direct about that. That has not been my experience. Like, I still have seen, and I, I'd be interested in what you all see. I mean, people will talk to me and they want to talk. And it doesn't mean that they all will, but mo it hasn't changed the number of people that are willing to talk in an internal investigation. Half of that probably is because... A company's code of conduct says you got to cooperate with an internal investigation, and they, you know, don't really know what else to do. Maybe, but I, it has. I haven't seen a dramatic decrease in the willingness of people to talk during an internal investigation. I agree with that, with one exception, um, based on some experience. So, anecdote isn't data, but um, if there's somebody that has actual knowledge that may be material to the proof of a crime, and they have counsel. Um, that council is pretty well incentivized to say, we're not talking to you. We're going to go talk to the yeah. government um, <laughs> that's right. and, and make a deal. Well, that's right. How does that affect the obligation under the company policy to cooperate? Well, I, I haven't seen one of those come to, to loggerheads yet, um, but it's probably inevitable that it, that it will. Um, I mean, it, obviously, the obligation remains there. But what are you going to do to somebody who's cooperating with the government? That yeah, or or asserting their Fifth Amendment right. right. Can you really terminate somebody that's asserting their Fifth right. Amendment right? I mean, they, the tough. people people in that position um, like who, who suffered adverse consequences from the company would probably find a friend in Senator Grassley's office. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> you would expect nothing less, right, George? Right. <laughs> I, I'm Don Santarelli. We once sat up there on the fourth floor next to George's office before George. But uh, I have a, the view. All coins have two sides. We have discussed here under the Yates memo the burden on the prosecutor if he makes a decision not to indict an individual for review. The levels of review aren't so clear. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a written or even firm policy procedure for that kind of review. But what about the other side of that coin? In a case where the defense counsel cannot persuade his client to plead guilty because he doesn't feel he is guilty, and you want a review from an Inspector Javert-type assistant U.S. attorney, there doesn't seem to be a way to accomplish that. Uh, you have to advise the assistant U.S. attorney and his boss, the U.S. attorney, that you wish to have it reviewed by the department. 
But then it becomes their job to set it up, and it's unilateral. He writes a memo, it goes somewhere to the department, whether it enters at the attorney general, at the deputy attorney general's office, as an associate deputy or something, whether it goes to the criminal division, it doesn't, you don't seem to know that, and you don't seem to have a way in which to be heard. They will review that unilateral memo from the U.S. Attorney's Office and tell you, you know, go away. What's the procedure and why isn't there a bigger uh, emphasis by the Department of Justice to be fair? We were fairer in my day than this. <laughs> of course, that's always the case. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll take a first crack at that, Don. Um, the, there is no procedure. You're, you're absolutely right. And um, uh, in my day, uh, who got heard depended a lot on who was asking, um, frankly. Um, and, and, and the merits of the case, um, you know, whether it was something that um, had um, uh, import to some national enforcement policy, was um, a highly visible matter, think, things of that sort. Um, um, I had a couple that came to me that involved potential prosecutions of, of members of the Senate, for example. Um, and those things sort of, they do, you know, merit um, uh, some attention. I had the Speaker of the House. Okay. Which well, we declined. So, um, so, but, but I, I have a couple times in uh, public discussions and perhaps more in private discussions said it would be good for the department to put in place a more regularized process. The argument against that is that as soon as you do that, everybody and his brother and sister are going to try to avail themselves of that process. And you, <laughs> excuse me, you obviously could bring the whole system grinding to a halt if everybody that disagreed with an AUSA somewhere in the field um, was able to appeal up the chain to, to Maine Justice. Um, so those kinds of reviews are, um, are granted more rarely um, in order to tamp down the sort of appellate rights that, um, if you will, that uh, people might say they have. But um, from the public perception of fairness in the justice system, it would seem that some guidance at least as to what merits review ought to be out there rather than the sort of grand or tradition of oral policy that exists. Well, maybe we've started a debate. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Didn't do any good when I served with the professor on the over-federalization of criminal law. <laughs> Didn't stop for a minute. Oh. All right, we have another question right here. Hi, my name is Elaine Middleman. I'm an attorney in private practice. And this may be more about the question of over-criminalization, but a case I wasn't involved in, but I read about the blanket chip case in West Virginia. Uh, he was convicted, essentially, I think, of violating a mine safety statute. But And the, I think there were three charges against him, but the jury just found one. But after they voted, it turned out it was only a misdemeanor. They didn't realize that. So his, the maximum sentence that he had was one year, which he has now served. But I think he's going to the Supreme Court to say that this wasn't, shouldn't be a crime because it was a safety violation. So, you know, if you, if you had a thought about that. I don't know too much about the specific facts of that case. I read about it um, as, as you did um, in the newspaper. I do know that there seemed to be a lot of controversy surrounding it. And um, it probably, whatever the merits of the case, it is representative of more cases that we see more regularly today where some kind of general criminal allegation, wire fraud, mail fraud, false statement, defrauding the United States, are based on regulatory standards, which are inherently ambiguous um, and subject to interpretation. There have been a couple courts. Um, you can read about it in an article I wrote for the Georgetown Law Review in 2007 called underbreaded shrimp and other high crimes and misdemeanors, um, where, where courts... Uh, Never come into your house for dinner. <laughs> where, uh, uh, some courts have um, exonerated, some appellate courts have exonerated defendants who were convicted on the basis of ambiguous regulatory standards, on the basis that 
um, where there's there's a legitimate disagreement between experts or even between judges on the interpretation of a statute. It's a violation of the due process clause to write a new standard per the prosecutor and then hold somebody accountable for, for violating it. I, Oops, go ahead. I was just gonna add one thing. Some some of this is is less um, due to the, the prosecutors, the Department of Justice. They're, they're dealing with the standards that they have. And I'll say this is somebody who, who worked uh, to draft criminal legislation in, in Congress. Congress, can do a better job at defining standards. And a lot of times you wind up uh, with matters finding their way to judges who, after somebody's been charged, looking at an ambiguous statute with, with uh, questions as to what are the standards under which, not just somebody to be prosecuted, but, but what, what are the standards for any form of liability, the ambiguity in terms of definitions within the statute. And then you have a regulation, which George said oftentimes they're ambiguous, they haven't been interpreted previously. And so sometimes prosecutors are put in a bad spot because the tools they're working with uh, haven't been sharpened, and they need to be sharpened more. Yes, we have another question. Is this, you can hear me? Okay. Uh, so I've heard a lot, a lot about getting rid of the Yates memo, uh, some of the business concerns resulting from the memo, um, but I haven't heard a lot about the fact that when the DOJ is coming to investigate, it's usually as a result of some accident. Uh, you know, people being killed. I, I think the uh, Massey uh, mine disaster was just mentioned. So I'm curious because those, you know, disasters cost money too, and you know, we don't want we don't want to see people dying. But I haven't heard a lot about what to do to prevent DOJ from coming in. So it, have you seen companies, you know, I guess backing up before an investigation, before an accident? to prevent all of this from happening in the first place, and what would you advise that they do if you're not seeing this? Well, I think um, corporations today spend an inordinate amount of resources and focus generally on compliance and trying to prevent fraud from happening at the company, trying to prevent accidents or safety issues, particularly in the safety issues. And as George said earlier, most corporations are, you know, really strong ethical and they understand that compliance needs to be part of their business um, going forward. And I think that not only helps from a business perspective, but it helps on the other end. If the Justice Department does come in, the fact that you had a functioning, implemented, focused, well-resourced compliance program to prevent criminal acts from happening at the corporation is taken into account by the Justice Department. And, and you know, they had even this past year or two a compliance expert in the fraud section at the Department of Justice who advised on these things. And I think she's leaving, but I suspect they might um, have another one. But I do think that there's a big focus on that. And I think that most public companies and most corporations really do focus on trying to make sure that ethics and compliance is a part of the day-to-day -day business. Uh, I, I agree with that. Um, Brian Miller is sitting here who is an expert on compliance programs from the perspective of both within the government um, and without. If you don't know, he's the guy who exposed GSA and their party hardy um, <laughs> schedule. Um, but, but, but not uh, undercover, right? When, when he was, uh, <laughs> uh, when he was the, the, the IG there. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's a great question because um, when the whole compliance sort of industry and movement, if you will, got started, there started to be a lot of trending, uh, in my experience at least, towards compliance for compliance sake, kind of check the box. Here's 10 things you need to do to be have a good compliance program. Um, but I think that's evolved, and it's certainly in the better companies um, have ev has evolved. It really is a risk management tool. Um, there are lots of risks. There's legal risks. There's risks of accidents. There's environmental risk and so forth. And um, most companies, in my experience, that operate truly effective compliance programs are using them as a risk management tool. So they're really putting their dollars where the risk is the greatest. I, I agree, and it's a, it's a great question. It's a great area of emphasis in the Phillip factors, the existence of a pre-existing compliance program. That is one of the factors, but I think that one thing that the department could do to really incentivize investments in that space is to make compliance programs and the effectiveness and adequacy of those programs a super factor. 
so that if you have a company that has invested wisely, they have an effective program and something happens, and, and no program is perfect, that there is additional weight given to that investment to try to get out and prevent, detect, remediate any sort of potential, whether it's a health and safety issue or something along the lines of corruption, fraud, uh, because I think that it's on that front edge that companies can do the most. On, you know, so after something's happened, they're hiring lawyers to go in and, and mitigate and reduce the exposure. But on the front edge, as George said, it's a risk management tool. If you incentivize it, more will be spent there. I think we have time for one more question. Anyone else? Any final thoughts? Alice? Um, well, I, I just think, you know, look, the, the Yates memo, um, is is out there. I think that the Justice Department is trying to follow it, and if there are tweaks, I think they can do it through guidance or training or things like that. But you know, I don't think that we should whatever talk about this. Don't lose sight of the men and women at the Department of Justice that you know, thankfully, go there every day to protect us and you know try to do their job and are focused and committed. And that certainly was my experience. And there are a lot of people in the room that are former Justice Department um, people. Uh, that worked really hard there, and I think that continues. That upholding justice, camaraderie, and, and mission is really important. Well said. My final thought, Dick, is to thank the Federalist Society, not just for this event, but for all the tremendous work they do. Um, if the, uh, if the maximum, maxim, rather, from humble beginnings ever applied to any organization, it's this one, so thank you. I, I think that, um, my, my sort of takeaway would be this memorandum has, as it's embedded in the U.S. Attorney Manual, uh, is, isn't as clear as it should be, but that's, this isn't the first of those type of memos that's occurred. And over time, they've been addressed to try to create clarity to those in the field who are trying to follow it, who are, as Alice said, um, good public servants. But that doesn't mean that the policy can't be sanded a little bit, refined, and remove some of the confusion that's, that's in it and the tension with other policies. And my final thought is no matter how good a system you think you've designed in the final analysis, unless the people who are charged with uh, uh, implementing it have good judgment, it's not going to work well. And so it's, it puts a heavier burden, more heavier than ever, on the leadership of the Department of Justice to determine who has good judgment, to promote those who have good judgment, and those who don't have good judgment to ask them to seek other <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you, Judge. <laughs>